Number one, thank you for being a great guest. My man, Jared, was telling me how he read all of my onboarding guesting materials right. as he was coming in. I did it early. Yeah, yeah. I think I did it yesterday or the day before. I was, I was you know, ready to rock and roll. So Yes. Uh, I met my man here at Podcast Movement in Denver, and we immediately hit it off. And mm -hmm. even before it was on air, uh, he represents and is the voice slash face of Strong by Design, which is a... Yeah, one of them. Yeah, we have a couple of us, but I'm, I'm one of them. It's a YouTube channel on working out lifestyle. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, Strong by Design. So we believe that uh, you were created to be strong, uh, mind, body, spirit. So we have uh, several of us that host uh, different episodes. We have our fitness guy, Chris, who uh, will you know, be able to tell you all about how to keep your, your physical body strong. Um, we have a, another girl, Tanya, she does like whole holistic health. Um, you know, what should you be eating? What should you not be eating? She, you know, episodes on cancer. Uh, Chris does stuff like he's brain certified. He's done lots of stuff on studying the brain and things like that. So, um, does some of that stuff. And then when they hired me a year and a half ago, they asked if I could, uh, help cover some of the faith and family um, and so, you know, we, we cross over into each other's stuff and Chris and I will do episodes together. And, uh, we've had one off the wall, uh, one where another guy in the office, we did, uh, uh, conspiracy theories, which was kind of fun. And he made us all these like foil hats that we <laughs> were wearing and kind of took us through different conspiracy theories. And so that was kind of a fun one. Um, but we're a mixed bag, but yeah, we, it's great. We, I'm, I'm glad I, this is my. I work for a company called Critical Bench. It's a fitness publishing company, and this is Strong by Design is our kind of our our, our ministry to give back. Um, and it's nice that I'm I'm a pastor uh, originally before working here. Came on uh, as a video production specialist, and so it's nice to have an outlet to to still uh, share God's truth and in my faith, and and uh, and so it's a it's a blessing to get to do that. And I'm excited to to get to be here with you. So awesome. Yeah, we have we have a great show, and uh, even before that, we'll probably come back to some of the exercise stuff we were talking about because yeah, I, I think it's it's so important. It's something that I'm currently on in this journey of like uh, working on yeah. my body, doing hard things. Yep, and the reality that like your mind, body, and spirit are actually all working together, and so if one is messed up, it 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 sinks over into the other spots. So. I've been listening to a lot of these discipline and motivational speeches while I'm working mm -hmm. out because I, I just yeah. want to, like, as I'm doing resistance training on my body, I want to, like, resistance train my mind at the same time. That's right. And, you know, like, the consistent message that comes through is what you're doing in private, you know, you go into yeah. hiding, do the work, then come out and show and all this other kind of jazz. What do you think about that? As far as, like... Just go get the work done. Yeah, yeah, discipline, that kind of jazz. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's something that you have to be intentional about. If you're not intentional, it doesn't happen, right? So, um, I mean, I, I've whether that's spiritual disciplines or that's physical disciplines. I mean, you you called me out before that we started the show. You said, "Hey, how, how are you working now?" And I said, "Well, I haven't," been. <laughs> you know. Um, and that's no. I mean, literally, the door's right there. It's basically a private gym that I have access to. Uh, I can use it whenever I want. My boss encourages us, go out there, get it done. And uh, if anyone had no excuses, it's me. And yet, if I'm not intentional about it, it just, it doesn't happen. And so, um, and, and you see that, you know, it's it's funny with, with gains and with fitness. Um, it, it takes a long time to get where you want to and it's gone in like two weeks, you know? So, uh, it's something that if you're not keeping up with stuff and really, uh, making it happen, uh, it, it falls apart quickly. And that's actually why I, I quit was because last November, it's been almost a year now, I had a really bad migraine. Uh, and, uh, it was so bad. Uh, actually my, my wife's, uh, mom was visiting us and I had, I get migraines and, you know, usually I can just take some Excedrin migraine, sleep it off, you know, whatever, maybe once or twice, uh, I'd say once every couple of years, I would get one so bad that it would cause me to like puke and stuff. Oh, and so this one was horrendous. It was really, really bad. Uh, my wife, Christiana and her mom and the kids, they all went out to eat. And all of a sudden I'm like, okay, it's going to be bad. I go to the bathroom 
and it gets, it's so bad. Like I can't stop throwing up. It's really bad. And then I get vertigo and I don't know if you've ever had vertigo, but like the whole room starts spinning and, uh, literally I'm on the ground. I tried to text Christiana. I tried to call her, could not get a hold of her. I'm like, man, I think I'm dying. I don't know what's going on. And I, I remember praying and saying, God, what, what do I need to do? And I remember God spoke to me and said, you need to dial 911. No one's going to do it for you. Um, and it was like, he was giving me permission to call because I'm like, I don't know if I, you know, and, and you, you never think you need it. Right. Right. Um, and so I dial 911. Um, you know, the paramedics come, thankfully we have like a lockbox, and I was able to give them, uh, you know, the lockbox uh, key so they could get in. They're like, can you come downstairs? I'm like, I'm literally on the floor and cannot move. Like I can't move when I try to get up, like everything's spinning. Um, and it's just, it's very bad. So they got there, they got me into my bed. Um, they were able to get like fluids into me right away and start giving me like medicine. The ambulance came, took me, you know, so it was a whole ordeal. I was in the, I mean, I didn't have to stay the night at the hospital, but you know, they gave me like the migraine concoction and got everything under control and ended up going to a neurologist, you know, but after that, um, it was, it affected my body. And, uh, for like a couple of months, like my neck hurt really bad and, uh, just trying to recover from that really bad migraine episode. I'm like, I can't work out. Like my body is not at a place that it can work out. And so, uh, then finally, you know, I'm in Florida. There's no AC out there. It was at that point, then it's the summer and it gets really, really hot, <laughs> you know, in the gym. And so uh, I just haven't, uh, been intentional to get back in there and get back to it, um, since that happened. And so, uh, my wife gives me a hard time about it all the time. She's like, Hey, remember when you had muscles? That was cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's one of those things that if even when when you have easy access to it, if it's not part of your plan, if you're not intentional about it, it's not going to happen. Um, and so I guess that's kind of my two cents about the whole thing. I, I did go to a neurologist, by the way, and I'm on uh, some some prescription now that's been like a lifesaver for me. And so i um, doing a lot better with, with migraine stuff, but uh, it was bad. Are you uh, – I- I'm very glad that you're doing better. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, are you going to incorporate something back into your, your physical routine? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start, um, uh, really, I, I should start yesterday. Um, you know, at least like three days a week, right? Like, um, no excuses, just get out there. I mean, we have machines, we have free weights, we have a cable machine, we have a turf, you know, we, anything you could possibly want is out there. If you want to do CrossFit, we have ropes, you know, so, um, I just need to get out there and, and even just dumbbells, like lifting dumbbells and just, just being active. And I heard recently actually that it, it's, uh, it's not like muscle building that keeps you young, it's mobility. Um, and mm. so as long as you're moving and you have the ability to move and you're, you know, it's your joints, it's your, your ligaments, it's all of those things. And it's when you lose your ability to be mobile, that's when your health really starts to decline. And so you see these people who are really old and they're really skinny, you know, and it's they're most of the time it's because they're just super mobile and active. Um, and that's what helps keep them healthy and young. That's really interesting because that's, mm -hmm. Dr. Attila's work, right? Outlive. Mm -hmm. And that's what that book's about. And then another, uh, another great personal brand, Dr. Gabrielle Lyons is kind of making the rounds and she's all about the musculature and, and, and building that up. And that's one yeah. of the keys to, to longevity. So what, what makes it the mobility, what makes that really great for a feel good father and under the sure. idea, right. That most of us the age of the new age of a new father is kind of increasing. Like we're a lot older when we're having kids now. Mm -hmm. So by the time the way I think of it is like, by the time our children are getting married, yeah, you know, especially if we have daughters and we want to dance, if you're a father and you want to dance with your daughter, yeah. that you could be 70 or 80 before that happens. Sure. Sure. So where, where does this come from? So I think it's really important. Uh, we live in a culture that, uh, we care about the now more than we care about the big picture. Mm. Um, and so you got to understand that what I do today is going to affect me 20 years from now. Um, and it's not, it's, it, it's, it's a slow 
grade, right? Um, and so it's something that if you're not making those changes now, then you are going to be in trouble 20 years down the road. And at that point, it's like, it's too late. Mm. And so you have to be making the changes now that you want to see happen 20 years from now. And so if you want, even for me, I mean, I'm almost, I'm going to be 40 uh, in February. And, uh, you know, when my grandkids, uh, you know, I'm imagining we have four kids, so I, I anticipate having grandchildren. I think, what are my parents not able to do with my kids that I want to be able to do with my grandkids um, because of health issues or whatever it might be? Or what did my grandparents do with me or what did they not do with me that I want to be able to do with my grandchildren? Um, and so what do I need to be doing now to prepare my body to be able to uh, to tackle those things. And uh, I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do. I mean, our bodies are going to age, we're going to get older. And that's, uh, that's, you can't stop that. But there are things that you can do to continue to have that mobility to continue to have that strength so that you can be uh, active with with your with the with your kids, you don't, I don't want my grandkids to come to my house and be bored. I want them to be, to love being with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, uh, because of the different things that I'm able to do with them, even cognitively, you know, whether it's playing games and things like that, you know, so keeping, keeping your mind fresh and going as well is also important. How do you define and project what you want for the future? How do you prioritize and build that list to make sure that, uh, you're living appropriately today for tomorrow? Uh, I, I think it starts out with a goal. Like, what do you, what do you want to, what do you know you want to be able to do when you're 60, when you're 70, when you're 80 years old? Um, is it just simply being able to take a walk, you know, around your neighborhood? Um, well, if that's the case, you should probably start walking now. Um, or, or at least doing some form, uh, of, of mobility. Mil just get a mobility. dog. Yeah. Get a dog. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think you have to know your, your end goal and then you work backwards is the way to prioritize. You know what I mean? Cause, uh, I mean, if my, and there's a guy, he's a, I think he's a Japanese guy, Okinawa, something like that. He's like 85 years old, the oldest person to ever do a triathlon. Um, you can look him up. Um, but he's this old, small looking, you know, Asian guy. Um, and it's just like running, you know, and, and it's cool. And it's like, obviously if he's like, Hey, I want to run a marathon, that's going to look a lot different than if I'm just saying, Hey, I want to be able to get, get down and get back up again so I can play on the floor with my grandkids. Okay. Well, if that's true, I need to be getting down and getting up every day you know, and, uh, making sure that I'm doing exercises too, like doing the research to say, Hey, I don't want to blow my knees out. I, you know, what are things that are going to be both good for my mobility and also good for my joints, uh, and the longevity. Um, and so making sure that you don't over, you know, there's that, that fine balance of, of overdoing it to the point that you, you kind of kill yourself as well. What are the, your specialty is on like family and spirituality. So sure. what are the elements of, family and spirituality that will contribute to this longevity. Yeah. So, uh, uh, our bodies and our, and our, and our minds and our spirits are all intertwined, right? They're all connected. And so, uh, if I'm, if I'm physically unhealthy, a lot of times I'll be mentally and spiritually unhealthy and you see that effect, right? There's something weird that happens when I'm working out regularly. Like I'm just a more joyful person. Um, I, I'm more, my brain is functioning better and not my mental well-being is, it feels better. My emotions are, are better regulated. Uh, sleep is a big deal, right? If I'm not getting enough sleep, eh, you know, I become a grump, you know, I become uh, short with the kids, you know, all of a sudden they spill a glass and instead of being like, hey, it's okay, life happens, you know, I'm frustrated and, and I'm what's wrong? Like, why would you do that? And why, why aren't you thinking, you know what I mean? And it's like, you're going in places that you know are not good places to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and yet you find yourself in those spaces. So, uh, it's all tied together. And so, uh, if, I if I'm not paying attention to, to my spiritual, uh, space, if I'm not connecting with God in a regular way and saying, Hey, how does that spill over uh, into my daily life? That can also start to affect my, my physical body, you know? And so, um, it, it's intent you almost compartmentalize all three, you know, 
I'm always learning. I always want to be challenging my brain. Uh, I'm always growing spiritually and saying, hey, God, what what are the things that I can be doing to, to be growing? Uh, and that looks different for everybody. There's a great book called Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. Highly recommend it. Um, and it has all of these different spiritual practices that you can do individually as well as in a community um, to help develop uh, your spirituality. Because a lot of times people are like, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? And they compartmentalize it to, oh, I got to get up early in the morning and I got to read the Bible and do a devotional. I struggle at that. I I, I suck at uh, doing a devotional every morning. Um, I'm just not good. But I can connect with God in so many other different ways. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a videographer and photographer, and I love taking pictures of, of like nature and image, you know, these things where I can see God's beauty and be like, this is awesome and kind of connecting with God in, in those spaces. Um, other people just love to be in nature and just walking, you know, hey, I like to take hikes. I like to uh, go camping. I like to, you know, so it's finding what is that thing in you that you love that God has placed in you mm-hmm. and then bringing God into that space and and using it as a, as a relational aspect because God is a relational God. Um, so then you have all of these, the three different areas, right? So you have, I'm learning uh, and I like, I only typically like will read stuff that's going to challenge my, my brain to think and grow. Um, that's just, I'm not a big fantasy or non, uh, I'm not a big fiction reader. I'm a nonfiction reader, um, for better, for worse. Uh, some people love, you know, fiction. Um, I just, I always struggled with it. Um, I love the books that have stories in them because then I can skip the story and get right to the meat and then I get through the book faster. Um, (laughs) So uh, you have that, then you have your spiritual stuff and then making sure you're doing something physically active, you know, taking care of your body, eating right, sleeping right. Um, And again, I don't always practice what I preach. Uh, I, with, with my wife's new job, we're running around a lot. We're find ourselves strapped and having to get fast food and then we feel terrible we feel sick you know and yet like we got to eat what are we going to do well i guess we're just going to run through mcdonald's you know and then every time we eat mcdonald's we're like why did we eat mcdonald's you know Uh, it's because it was cheap and easy and it's not even that cheap anymore so that's great i I had a question about the uh uh, your spirituality with community that's something that is really interesting to me i think that feel good fathers and men in general in today's society yeah. have a lot of trouble connecting with other people, yeah. connecting with other men in general. Yeah. We have a loneliness epidemic. It's now mm-hmm. more people identify as having one or fewer. I think it's like half of all men have one or fewer close friends. We mm-hmm. don't know how to be with each other. We have. I only have you, Jay. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Anytime. You got me. Yeah. Uh, Our second conversation. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's crazy. Like it's, it's crazy that we have sure. the most access to technology, the most access to information, the most access to what we want right now. Mm-hmm. And it should be as this intermediary to get us back face to face with people. Yeah. Uh, but it's actually just this stay on platform thing. Yeah. Um, how do you, let's, let's, Let's get to the question. Sure. What do you do or what would you suggest? Mm-hmm. Number one, let's go for uh, some feel good fathers are secular. So mm-hmm. what's a way that you as a father can connect with your community? Yeah. And then let's, let's pull that so, into the spiritual side too. Let me, let me pull it back just a little bit. A lot of times, you know, at least from a church background is people are like, oh, you got to get in a small group. Small groups work for some people. They don't work for everybody. Um, I've never been a small group guy because I feel... Uh, there, there's a lot of th- issues that I have. Uh, again, I don't want to knock. I know some people like love them, and they they're a part of a group that they love, and they would die by it. And and I'm like, that's awesome, and I and I and I want that for you, and I want that for everybody. But the problem with small groups at church is typically you get put with people who you wouldn't normally connect with. Mm. Um, and so yes, you yes you have the Bible, and yes you have Jesus, and you and you're trying to have conversations about that, and and then apply it to your own own space but you're not necessarily journeying with those people and so i think finding people uh that at least and and again this comes back to intentionality right if you're not intentional you're never going to find these people um but finding people that are like-minded and in, in things that you enjoy doing. So, I mean, men in particular like to do something. They don't just like to sit around and talk about their feelings. So 
Can you go play top golf with some people? Can you go golfing with some people? Can you do a sport? Um, when I was pastoring in Iowa, I started a, a fantasy football league and I did that intentionally to get the men to get together at least once a year. And we would have a, uh, like a, an actual draft party where I'd have them all bring food and we would hang out and we would get to know each other. We would draft, we would, you know, just have fun just being people. And, uh, I think men, uh, are oftentimes, uh, we have so much pressure on our shoulders, especially as fathers and as husbands, where we're trying to carry the weight that finding a healthy place to just be um, can be sometimes difficult. In our culture, like typically for men, it's like sports or, or, or the bar, right? And it's like those are kind of like their two outlets. And both of those can be really unhealthy, um, if, you know, if not kept in check. Right. Um, I don't, I'm not a big like bar scene guy anyway. I just never have been. Um, you know, I don't, I don't mind having an occasional drink with somebody, um, whatever. Um, I think beer tastes horrible. That's just my, my, my preference. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that all of your people can comment and tell me how stupid I am for, for saying that beer comment, tastes terrible. Comment below. Let us know. Comment below. Are you, yeah, are you... Tell me why I'm dumb. And, and everyone's like, oh, you got to try this one. Or you got to try that one. I'm like, they all taste the same to me. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, can I tell you a quick story? Uh, a pastor of mine, he has like this whole like whiskey room. And he had all the pastors over and it was like this whiskey tasting. And it was, he had like four different, uh, aged, uh, whiskeys that were the same brand, just different years. And it was like, it was like one, five, 13 and like a 22 year old whiskey. And so he's re pulls out his book and he's reading everything that's in it, you know? And, uh, I'm just like, this is, they all taste the same and they all taste rubbing, terrible. Rubbing alcohol, uh, yeah, rubbing yeah. alcohol, and, rubbing alcohol. And so we get to the last one and he's like, I'm just making fun of it the whole time. And he's like, you don't get to drink this one. And it's, it's far. And I'm like, no, no, no. I drank everything else. You are giving me the, the 22 year old, whatever it is, and I'm going to drink it. And so, um, I did and it tasted the exact same as everything else. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think finding ways to connect with people. Uh, another thing I did with a guy in Iowa is, he was really into woodworking. And so I'm like, that sounds like a fun thing to do. And, and he built like a wood shop in his garage. And so I went over once a week and we just hung out and built stuff. Um, and it's, I think it's in those moments when you're doing something with somebody that naturally and organically, uh, you start to have conversations, you get comfortable with the person, you get to know them. Um, and so I, I think it's finding something that you enjoy. Um, and then finding other people that enjoy it, um, and then being able to share life with them in, in, in those moments. And so, um, and that's going to look different for everybody. Um, and you know, even if it's, Hey, we get together and we watch uh, a football game or hockey or whatever, you know, I have another guy in Colorado that, um, he's a big Colorado avalanche fan. And, uh, I'm originally from Colorado too. So as soon as like, hockey season just started. And so it's like, all of a sudden I'm reconnecting with Michael Vance, you know, um, and, and we're, we start catching up on life, you know, because of that. So, um, and it's just, it just, I think that that that's kind of the icebreaker when you just get a bunch of people in the room and say, Hey, let's talk about our feelings. It just, it, it always flops. I think one of the, it's a well-documented paper now that talks about that, uh, men and women approach. It was there. It was a therapy paper. It was a study on therapy sure. and it was like the results from therapy. And they're saying for women, it's great, but for men, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and number one, that's because the th uh, therapists are dominated by women and some men just don't, you know, like it's, it's hard mm -hmm. if you have like, if you got sexuality issues or something like that. Like it could be yeah. challenging to have that conversation with a woman. Um, mm -hmm. but then the, the other, but the main thing I think is, um, women want to face each other and have the deeper conversation mm -hmm. about their feelings and want to roll each other and, and do that. Whereas men, as you're saying, they want to walk side by side and they want to yeah. do something together. And that, that goes down to just hormones and it's vasopressin mm -hmm. is the main one there versus oxytocin, right? Women have more oxytocin, not wait, I'm not saying that right. Yes, I am. Oxytocin uh, receptors and men have more vasopressin. Vasopressin is activated when you accomplish something with another with another person, mm -hmm. and so um, that's a whole brand of brothers idea, that kind of jazz, right? You kept, get together, you solve a problem together, mm -hmm. and that's how you do it. Um, absolutely love it. Uh, thanks for sharing. This has been really good. Uh, yeah, uh, we have some some points here on on fatherhood and then and then being a husband. Sure. So 
I, I thought this was really interesting. We were talking off air about boundaries and, and what's sure. your take on that? Uh, good book. Another good book is boundaries. I don't know if you've read it or not. Um, but they're, uh, creating healthy boundaries, um, both for yourself and for your kids, um, and your marriage. Um, uh, I mean, uh, I think that we don't, uh, we don't think about boundaries enough, um, and, and what that looks like. And so, uh, you know, my wife and I have been very intentional with, uh, you know, technology boundaries. What do those look like for our kids? What are we allowing them to do? And what are we not allowing them to do and not allowing our culture to dictate, um, what those boundaries are, mm. um, which is, uh, you know, a lot of times countercultural, um, and people, you know, all of a sudden you're the crazy people, you know, that don't let your kids have phones, you know? Um, but I'm like, man, you're not ready. Like your, your brain is still developing. I've always thought it was interesting that you can't rent a car until you're 25. The reason you can't rent a car until you're 25 is because the car companies know that your brain is still developing and you make really poor choices, mm. you know? Mm. Uh, and, uh, it's at 25 that you reach that age where not everyone is like fully matured at 25, but it, your brain has had, had enough time that the majority of the public now um, have reached that, that level of, uh, I'm no longer just going to go run and jump off a cliff because I'm a, I'm a guy and I, and I'm, and I'm crazy. You know, yeah. um, I, I have a little bit more sense of responsibility and my brain has now been developed. And so we, we have that standard and we have that understanding, uh, with car companies, but then when it comes to human beings and kids making choices, we think, Oh yeah, they can do that. They can make their own choices. I remember yeah, years ago. Yeah, let them ago, choose whatever they want. I remember years ago and, when uh, Instagram was releasing the Instagram Kids, and they mm -hmm. had announced that they were doing it. Huge backlash. Everybody was like, "No, no, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't do it." And and people were citing studies, what social media does to the brain, all that kind of jazz. And then they did it anyways. And it's not just Instagram; it's Facebook and all that kind of stuff. Kids messengers, right. all the different yep. platforms have it, and we see the rise in depression, negative emotion, suicide, suicide, uh, yep. suicide attempts. Uh, yep. It's crazy. And it's just like, yeah. come on, how, yeah. I, I completely agree with you um, that we need to have it's boundaries. Just, mm -hmm. And I mean, that's one example, right? Another boundary that we have is we don't let our kids do sleepovers um, because you don't know what's going to happen in someone else's house. Um, you don't know. I mean, you, you do your best to, you know, protect your own house. And even then, you know, stuff gets through. Um, a lot of uh, times, you know, a cousin will show up and, you know, all of a sudden you hear stories about, Hey, I was staying over at my friend's house and their cousin was there and he, he showed us his penis or whatever, you know? Um, and it's like, you hear these stories all the time. And when we were kids, we just, we went ever, you know, no thoughts, you know, it's just, we just did it. And my parents were cool with it. And I don't know, something has happened. And I think part of that is, is technology and social media where people are exposed to stuff earlier. Mm -hmm. And then kids are curious, right? And they want to know things and they want to be an adult. I, my 10 year old daughter wants to be my wife and acts like my wife. And, uh, Christiana sprained her ankle. And the other day, Karia is like, pulled out an ACE bandage and is like wrapping her ankle. And I'm like, why are you doing that? And she's like, oh, well, mom has an ACE bandage on, so I should have an ACE bandage on. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, like it's such a silly thing, you know? Um, but they want to be older and they want to understand adult things, but their brains aren't ready for it. They aren't uh, mature enough to process that information. And, and we think, oh, it's fine. They'll be okay. They can handle it. And I, especially like with Halloween right now, like uh, the things that we're exposing our kids to is like, holy cow, I can't believe you let your kid watch that. Like, you know, horror movies and slasher films and all of these things. And they're like, oh, it's, fun. It's, it's just all in good fun. And I'm like, but it's not because you are shaping your child's brain to think and operate a certain way. And it's outside of mo moral reality. Um, there's actually and it's a, a problem. Uh, on this, this piece, um, I love the moral reality part, but there's actually a, a study that uh, hyper violent images whether it be from the news or from horror movies and sexual images, uh, mm -hmm. pornography, or even just magazines, men's, mm -hmm. men's interest, women's interest magazines, um, your brain never forgets them. Your, right. your brain is, it's, it's an information storing device and it never forgets the, the violence, um, the horror images or the sexual ones because what you know if we think about us as a species right it's like fear aggression avoidance of pain that's one side 
then you have the um, procreation on the other side and just never forgets those things. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yep. Yep. Uh, another, uh, on to that as well as music. Um, and, and like the, the sex and violence that get put, put, that gets put in music and music is the, they've done studies on this too, mm. where it's, if something is, is brought into your brain through a mel melodic line, you don't have to physically or, or intentionally put it into your long-term memory. It just automatically goes there. Um, where everything like you and I are having a conversation and we're just talking, mm. I have to hear what you say and then put it into my, my, my long-term memory. But for some reason with music, it just goes and gets, it gets filed away without you even having to think about it. That is very interesting. That's completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Wow. I'm going to do some research. <laughs> that's yeah, really yeah, crazy. Yeah. Uh, so you had uh, another. That's why they have that, That's why they have you listen to Mozart and stuff as a baby. Mm -hmm. um, there's something about music and, and the tones and things like that, that it just, it affects your brain differently. That's awesome. Good. I'm filing that away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had another one about, um, do you want me to sing it to you so you can remember? <laughs> yes, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I'm just <laughs> All right. So it's not the church's job to teach your kids about God. What, yeah. What's this take? Yeah. So, uh, I was a youth pastor for a long time and, uh, you know, for some parents, youth group was a babysitting service, you know, uh, whether they, I don't know if necessarily they, they, believed in, in God themselves or not. And, and that's fine, you know, for those, you know, we, we're not going to, we want kids to be there and we want to be able to teach them. Uh, but for someone that is, Hey, I'm a follower of Jesus. Um, uh, and it's like, there's this fear of, of teaching, uh, about the deep things of God or, or, or I'm not qualified or whatever it might be that's keeping you from doing it. And it says, you know what, I'm just going to take them to church and I'm going to let the, let the church teach my child for me. And that is not a biblical principle. I mean, uh, it, you know, scripture clearly says, teach your children in the ways that you want them to go, you know, um, you know, and, you know, put it, bind it on your hands, you know, put it on your foreheads and always be speaking it to them um, so that it, it becomes part of, of, of their daily life. And they need to see it in you as well. So they need to see me like they're watching everything that you do. And if you're not living out uh, your relationship with Christ and, and the decisions you're making and the things that you're watching and uh, the activities you're participating in and the way that you're treating the guy that cut you off uh, driving down the highway, you know, and the way that, uh, you know, are you, you know, interacting with your neighbor, you know, all of these things they're watching. And it, it's my job to teach my kids about God. And then I want the church to come alongside and they're supplemental to what's being taught at home. But I think a lot of times that gets reversed where we're like, we want the church to teach our kids. And then I'll, I'll just, we'll just keep it surfacey on the, on the drive home or whatever, and then kind of go back into, you know, sports or whatever else we want to talk about. And I just, I think it's, it's, I don't think, I know that's backwards. That's not the biblical model that we've, that, that we've been given. Um, it's my job as the father uh, it's my responsibility to be investing in my kids. Um, and that's all across the board. I mean, that's in their spirituality, all, all of these aspects that we've talked about mentally, you know, um, and I know that we kind of touched on this a little bit about like, you know, public school, homeschool, whatever, but your, your kid's education is your responsibility. When, however you decide to make that happen, uh, there's their understanding of who God is and, and what God has done for them. It's your responsibility. It's nobody else's responsibility. That's God has entrusted them to you. And so you need to take that responsibility seriously. Love it. Uh, love it. A good take. Uh, your role as a husband and father is to lead your house and your wife yeah. spiritually. Yeah. So uh, after our, so we have four kids. Uh, we have uh, eight year old twins a 10 year old daughter and an 11 year old son. So when the twins were born, uh, our oldest son was three. So we had four kids, three and under crazy time, yes. right? Um, that first year is a blur. Uh, my wife had, uh, extreme postpartum depression after, uh, the twins were born. Um, her body did not bounce back the way that it did with the first two. Um, and, uh, just all kinds of different things. And so we ended up going to a, a really, really good Christian counselor, uh, and when we were in Iowa and we still have connections with her. Um, and if we're going through something and we need to talk to somebody, we'll still call her up and she'll, she'll, she'll meet with us through, through zoom. And, uh, 
something that she's she, something that's great that she does is she gives you a temperament test. Um, it's a very deep in. Uh, it's called the Arno profile system, and it's like it divides your personality or not your personality. It divides your temperament, uh, and your temperament just to define it is the way that you naturally uh, are wired and interact with the world around you. Mm. So um, the thing is, is that our our there are things that we adapt to. So your home family system, uh, you adapt your natural wiring in order to survive your family system. Okay. So if you're naturally an introvert, but your family's extroverted, you feel like the only way to be accepted is I got to be extroverted too. And so you, you start adapting to that. Then as you get older, you start to create the facade or the persona of what you think the person perfect person looks like. And so then that's the person that you try to proclaim to the world. That's what we see on, on Facebook and Instagram, right? Is that, that person that, uh, we think will be most accepted by the world around us. Mm. And then everything else we try to keep hidden. Um, and so what the temperament test does is it brings you back to the original creation of who God made you to be in three areas in, uh, acceptance in control and inclusion. These are kind of the three areas that it, it breaks you down in. Um, and then there's like five different temperaments in each of those. And there can be like cross temperaments and things like that. So all of that to say, uh, in control specifically, my wife is what is called choleric and a choleric is a person who loves control. They like everything like everything has an order they walk into a room and say okay this is what's wrong and this is what needs to be fixed my natural temperament is uh supine and supine is naturally submissive um and it's not i just i don't i don't care like i don't want to control anyone naturally and i if you want to have chicken let's eat chicken if you want to have steak let's have steak i don't care you know like um i i, I just don't have a strong opinion on on most things i'm happy to go with the flow um and what we learned in this counseling session is that christiana uh desperately wanted someone to give her boundaries mm. um and wanted someone not to control her um but to lead her um, and that our marriage was always going to struggle until uh, our our roles reversed. And so, uh, you know, we I, I can't tell you the scripture off the top of my head, but there's a scripture that says, like, wives, submit to your husbands. And that can come across very harsh, especially in our culture. It's not like, it's not a slave. It's not like you shut up and you do what you're told. You know, it's, it's not like that. It's saying there's a natural order that God designed things to work in. And the the man uh, was designed to lead the home and to be to lead the home in a spiritual way. And when I started stepping up and Christiana started learning to surrender, like it literally saved our marriage. Um, just that, that role reversal um, where she, we were with the depression and the kids and stuff like that, we were slowly drifting apart. And uh, that was one of the things that completely flipped us back around. And, and I'm not perfect at it still. I'm still battling my, my natural temperament mm. um, to... Uh, just go with the flow and not worry. Um, and I have to be very intentional to say, okay, what does it look like for me uh, to lead our home in this? How do I make my home a sanctuary and a place that's that's safe, both physically and spiritually, for my home, for my family? You know, uh, and and that's uh, and then Christiana has to continue to say, okay, Jared doesn't lead the way that I would do it. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's wrong. And so she's uh, battling her temperament and saying, okay, I'm going to do this God's way and not the way that I think that it should be. Uh, and I'm going to say, hey, if Jared says this is what we need to do, and I trust that he's following God, right? That's the way that it works. Is It only works if if I'm doing what God is asking me to do. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm doing what Jared wants me to do and I'm trying to make everyone else do it, then that's a problem. And that's that's like abuse of power, right? And that, that messes up the order of things as well. But if I'm saying, "Hey, I'm 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 following Jesus," and as I'm praying and as I'm and as I'm saying, "God, where do you want us to go as a family?" and I come to Christiana and I say, "Hey, I've been praying about this, and this is what I think God is is asking us to do," she's going to say, "Hey, I trust you." Uh, she and she's done that so many times. Like even with moving to Florida, um, we're praying through. Is this is God asking us to uproot our family from Colorado and and move? however many thousands of miles away from our family. And it got to the point where I'm like, I'm, I'm always asking her, what are your thoughts? Give me your, your, your input. And it got to the point where she said, Jared, 
I know that you've prayed about this and I trust that you can hear from God and I'm going to trust uh, the decision that you come up with because I trust that God is leading you. Um, and that's the way that it's supposed to work. Um, and, uh, and, and it's not a domineering thing. Uh, we may, it's not like we make decisions together, you know, and we, we work through problems together. Um, but uh, being the leader doesn't mean that it's my way or the highway. You know, being the leader means I'm always drawing us back and saying, hey, we would need to follow God in this and not what I think or what you think. That's what being the leader is. The the second, that makes sense. it absolutely does. The second yeah. part of that, it's in Second Peter's that, uh, or Second Peter rather, that uh, many people don't quote is that uh, mm-hmm. uh, she is responsible for loving um, herself and the kids he's mm-hmm. responsible for bringing love into the home. Yeah. And so, um, and that there, there's a lot of different ways of interpretation right. and there's yeah. so much yeah. more to go into, into those verses. So yeah. Um, yeah. it's good stuff. My yeah. man, Jared, thank you so much for sharing here. If folks want to, yeah. uh, get a hold of you, we're, done. More, we're, at, the we're at the end. And oh man, so fast. I know it does. It Just goes, roll that thing. and, uh, there's a, there's gonna be a podcast interview episode in the show notes. Uh, you've supplied that to kind of get noted get to know you. If folks want more, where will they go? I mean, they can go to strong by design. Um, uh, you know, we have a website, we're on YouTube. Um, you know, we're, uh, like I said, I already explained what the show is. So please uh, go check that out. Um, you know, I have my own normal social stuff that I'm posting, you know, uh, you know, my normal, if, if we have like little reels and stuff from the podcast, I post that on my, my own, um, I don't know. I don't even know what it is. Jared Haley, probably something, something. I'll, I'll make it down. Um, yeah, yeah. You just look <laughs> it up. But uh, you know that uh, really, I would I would drive people back to to our podcast. You know, we're uh, trying to, or we're not trying. We're we're starting to get some higher profile guests and things like that. So it's it's really fun to to see the show grow. We have you know th- over three hundred episodes now. So we're we're really kind of trucking along. Congratulations. Well done. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jared. Everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yo. If you like this episode, it is so important that you hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss another episode because, listen, this is important information. Am I right? Thank you. That's right. It is. And Feel Good Fathers, check it out. Right here above my shoulder is the next episode. YouTube gods have decided that this is the one. This is the one that's best for you. It's a good one. It's going to be from my channel. Jared's right. Click on it now.